Hi there, welcome to another live webinar with us from Boot Futures. And today we will be discussing trading opportunities in base metal. Well, the context for the situation, we have base metals like copper, aluminium, zinc, and nickel notching multi-year highs. So through this webinar, we will hear from product specialists from the London Metal Exchange, Amalgamated Metal Trading Singapore, and fast markets on where base metals prices could be headed and what are the key market developments that traders should keep a keen eye on. Some of the key questions that we will be addressing today. Uh, yeah, base I metals. I cannot hear. Uh, yeah, several base metals are at multi-year highs. What are the economic and fundamental catalysts that we should be watching? Commodities, super cycle versus inflation battle, identifying the push pull factors for base metal prices and rise of EVs, new trends, new products and new opportunities. And with the launch of Chinese contracts such as iron e bonded copper, what are the potential arbitrage opportunities across different markets? And then we will end the session with a Q&A. Uh, now let me introduce you to who our panelists are. First, we have uh, Edric Ko. Edric is, uh, he joins LME in 2014 and he's based in the Singapore office where he's the head of corporate sales in Asia and has over 15 years of experience in commodity price risk management. Next, we have Boris. Boris Mikanikrizai. I hope I got your name right, Boris. He's a precious and base metals analyst at Fast Markets London. And he's also responsible for conducting research on supply and demand trends across the metals complex. And last but not least is the very pleasant Jolene Chu. Jolene is the CEO of the Amalgamated Metal Trading Singapore, a metal derivatives broker and dealer delivering trading solutions to businesses, funds and financial institutions globally. And uh, now I will uh, do a quick sound check. If you can uh, hear us clearly, please head down to the question box on your control panel. You can find a question box somewhere at the bottom and type a resounding yes if you can hear us clearly. All right, Robin, thank you. Thank you for confirming that you can hear us clearly. Nick, Nick, thank you so much. All right, uh, now I'll hand the reins over to the manager for commodities for Philip Futures. It's none other than my good friend, Min Hao. Min Hao, if you're all set to go, over to you. Thank you, Sri. Uh, <clears throat> give us a moment. I think we are facing a, a bit of a technical issue for Edric. Edric, can you hear us? Hello, Edric. All right, while well, uh, Edric is figuring out the sound system, uh, dear audience, at any point in time, if you'd like to leave questions for our panel of experts to address, please go to the question box and type the questions there. All right, thank you, Tung, for confirming that you can hear us. And, um, any point in time, just leave your questions there and we will address them towards the end of the webinar in our Q&A section. All right, Edric, can you hear us, Edric? Yes, finally. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you and see you. All right, <laughs> Minhao, I'm going to step out right now. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Sri, and uh, good evening, everyone from Singapore. My name is Minhao and I'm from Philip Futures Commodities Team. So I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. <clears throat> Today we'll be discussing trading opportunities in the base metals market. So just a quick introduction again. Uh, first, I, we have a Mr. Edric Koh from a London Metals Exchange, LME. Edric, uh, I'll pass over to you. Perhaps you can give us a quick and short introduction of, of yourself, please. Sure, sure. Very good evening uh, to all of you, uh, depending on your time zone. Good afternoon, good morning. Uh, I'm Edric. I sit in Singapore for, uh, working for London Metals Exchange. I head up the corporate business here in Asia. So my, my role is really to advise 
corporates and users on how to use the LME to hedge their metals price risk. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Edric. Next, uh, we have Ms. Jolene Chiu from Amalgamated Metal Trading, AMT. Jolene, uh, can you share with us a bit about yourself, please? Yeah, so uh, for me, um, I'm the CEO of the Singapore office uh, for AMT. Our headquarters is in London. So our office is relatively new in the region. Uh, we've just opened the office actually in October last year. So the main purpose is really to you know, expand uh, the business, especially in this part of the world in Southeast Asia. Thank you, Jolene. Right, next, uh, finally, we have a panelist from UK. Uh, Mr. 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 Boris Mikani Kretzai from Fast Markets. Boris, uh, can you tell us a bit more about yourself, please? Yes, yeah, sure. So I work uh, as a research at uh, as a research analyst at Fast Markets. We're based in uh, London, uh, and I cover base metals uh, and also a bit of precious metals. So we do different type of analyses. We we'll, you know, we look at the macroeconomic backdrop. We look at fundamentals, technical approach, quantitative things, etc. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I tend to specialize on copper and, uh, and tin, but, you know, I like all the metals. All right. Thank you, Boris and everyone for the quick introductions. So just a reminder again, before we start the main panel, that uh, after this uh, session, we will also be having a short Q&A at the end of the session. But if any of our audience, if you have any questions, do feel free to send them in on the webinar platform at any time. All right, so let's uh, dive straight into the discussion. For the first part of the panel, uh, I'd like to touch on the broad market economics first. So as we all know, it has been a very interesting one to two years for the base metals market. First, we saw the market collapse in March last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, along with the entire commodities basket, as well as uh, many other asset classes. Then in response to this, uh, many of the central banks around the world have come up with many easing measures to support their economies. And as we are aware, a large part of this money supply have actually flowed into commodities, resulting in a very strong rally lasting all the way to this year. And then just a while back, a few months ago, the high prices have def definitely caught the attention of uh, a few of the governments and uh, prompted them and the central banks, especially those in uh, US and China to uh, take action to try and curb this price rally. So firstly, perhaps we can hear from Edric. I think the most obvious question that we, we all have now is uh, where are we now in this market cycle? Are we still in this uh, commodity super cycle supported by weak US dollar? Or, and also what are the factors that the market participants can look out for perhaps uh, in the coming uh, three to six months. Sure, sure. Thank you, thank you, Ming Hao. I think yes, given the you know the the prices has been like a roller coaster ride recently. Uh, I wouldn't call it exactly a super cycle, because if you look at back in uh, early in the millennia, you know, uh, where China is showing double digit growth and and, and you're know, buying almost everything up uh, uh, globally. That is, is, is a super cycle, I think. But currently now, this, this, this situation is likely, I would say, uh, driven mainly by pent up demand, given you know, we've been in this COVID situation for almost two years now. Uh, so you see a lot of this uh, slight easing uh, globally you know, in China, they started first, and then of course you have US and then Europe also recovering. So you see people coming back, uh, demanding for goods and services, automobiles, cars, IT gadgets, you name it, you got it, you know. So people are just, just, just wanting to, to spend more. And in terms of supply side, actually, uh, this year we have pretty much quite balanced. I would say, yes, fairly tight. But this year, compared to last year, a lot of producers are coming back. They are no longer, they're coming out from, you know, being locked down. They are starting to ramp up their production. Uh, but that said, because of, you know, COVID situation, on and off, you may see some, very short term squeezes like what we have seen in China in the recent uh, port closure, uh, I think the third largest port in, uh, in globally. So such situation perhaps may excavate certain supply issues. Then you may see sometimes some short term squeeze in terms of prices. So I think in terms of the risk where, you know, for market participants to look out for is, uh, you know, I'm sure Boris later will share more is perhaps, is there signs of slowing growth? Uh, we see, you know, some, some things coming out from China. Uh, the, you know, the growth is, is slightly slowing down, uh, perhaps re even resurgence of COVID. Now we have Delta. 
So what, what's next? Will it be echo for stroke? You know, so I think it's, it, it's not going to go away for a while. And last but not least, the high prices itself, I, I reckon is also a threat. Uh, from a few point of view, one is of course you have a, it's, it's inflationary. Uh, governments around the world are, are concerned with all these rise in metals prices, input prices. Will this drive up, uh, you know, goods, the prices in general? Will it, is it sticky? Will it stay? And we have produced, uh, we have fabricators, you know, trying to hold back in increasing prices. But how long can they do that? If they start to push, you know, you know, pass on the prices to, to clients, then potentially there may be some uh, demand disruption. Uh, in fact, just to share very briefly, uh, this morning, in fact, I have clients, fabricators calling, calling up to, to find out more about, you know, uh, actually on their request of their clients to fix metals prices because of such situation. They cannot pass on prices to their clients any longer. So their clients are demanding for fabricators to actually hatch on their behalf uh, to fix the price. Yeah. So I think these are the, some of the key, key things that uh, uh, market participants should, should, should watch out for. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Edric. That was uh, very insightful. So next, uh, I'd like to hear from Jolene. I think uh, just a while back, China's government has actually uh, taken quite uh, strong steps. So the statements and actions of the Chinese government to intervene in the base metals market, uh, I, I think the market has definitely received uh, this uh, this. Uh, has definitely received attention and it seemed like a very stern message that uh, they are delivering with the release of the state reserves and also the issuing of warnings to the Chinese domestic commodity companies to stop driving up prices. So Jolene, based on what you see in the market and uh, the trading activity, how do you see this play out and also whether the traders all around the world, be it international or Chinese, are they approaching this uh, intervention with caution? Sure. Um, so thank you, Min. I think with regards to, you know, the Chinese, uh, the China SRB intervention, uh, you know, we can definitely see this playing out in a number of ways. So I think in the short term, uh, the Chinese government, you know, they have been successful as well as effective in their short term agenda. Uh, when the announcement was made basically in June, uh, we saw prices retreating quite substantially over the following couple of months. So I would say this move in price has been reasonable as well as expected. Um, so China's effort to curb speculative demand and basically discourage um, physical hoarding did not really address you know, the fundamental causes of this rally. So the price surge that we saw you know, early in the year and most of last year was driven mostly by strong stimulus demand as well you know, as a constraint on supply. So ultimately, um, it's a macro situation that has impacted both demand and stimulus. So it's the Fed tapering, you know, it's the interest rate hike that, you know, we're expecting and concern over, you know, China as well as Asia economic slowdown due to the Delta variant spread, as well as COVID related supply chain disruption. You know, these macro factors are the one that is actually, you know, driving the recent LME price correction that we saw, you know, on Thursday last week. Um, I think rather than, you know, the Chinese intervention. So I think the commodities market is, you know, has been quite interesting, you know, in the last two weeks. And I think this week, especially, you know, it's, it's uh, we're entering to a high stake week. So I think everyone's watching, uh, you know, the Jackson Hole event that is happening this Friday on further insights on, um, you know, the um, Fed, um, you know, decision basically on any tapering or, you know, um, on, on, on the asset purchase. So uh, I think, I'm not sure if you guys heard uh, people dialing in, um, you know, last week there are a few rumors circulating in the market um, that, you know, China might be halting its stockpile sales in August. Uh, but so far, you know, this news has been, you know, rebuffed by the, the China authorities. So I don't think it's surprising considering, you know, their core aim has been achieved from, you know, the recent sell-off that we saw in the market. So there's less pressure on the Chinese government basically to sell off their inventory. You know, but ho however, you know, this might all change as we saw prices, you know, ticking up in the last two days. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, basically buying on dips as well as, you know, dollar weakness is contributing to, you know, the high, higher prices that we see right now. And I think moving on to, you know, the longer term, I think China has basically uh, a limited ability to reduce strong demand internally, you know, without impacting its overall economic growth. So, in fact, on the supply side, you know, you're actually working against it. So with its decarbonization efforts, as well as, you know, environmental control um, 
and also power curb in place is basically impacting you know the supply the, the supply of uh, metals coming out of China. And um, as a result of this intervention, uh, they're actually interfering with the free market, which may be a deterrent on the supply side. So basically any ongoing effort by China to suppress any price increases means less financial incentives for the physical market to prepare for any future supply and demand tightness in terms of investment. So, you know, this can be in the form of exploration of new mines or also substitution of other materials. Um, besides that, you know, there are also other long-term factors such as the, you know, fiscal and infrastructure spending that might uh, drive basically the long-term uh, demand for base metal. And also, um, lastly, you know, a global shift towards more environmental sustainability and surging EV demand that would determine where, you know, base metal prices are heading in the longer term. So in, in conclusion, I think obviously the intervention has an impact in the short term in terms of curbing um, speculation as well as price volatility. But ultimately, um, it's the macro developments that has basically driven price direction and ultimately the fundamental drivers would ultimately to take, you know, where the prices will go in the long term. So um, Min, moving on to the second part of your question, I think you're asking if, um, you know, uh, the traders, both international and Chinese, uh, will they be approaching this intervention with caution? So I think China has been a major player in this market and, you know, the metal consumption has surged, you know, in the last two decades. And from what we've seen recently um, in the equity market sell-off for Chinese stock, I think we cannot underestimate, you know, how powerful and uh, disruptive the Chinese government intervention and regulation can basically impact the market. So for me, I would definitely be, you know, watching this space closely. Um, I think that traders also have the right to be cautioned, but I think it's worth noting that there are other important factors outside of China, such as the change in, you know, monetary policy, um, as well as strong physical demand in US and Europe that are actually driving these prices. Okay, thank you very much, Jolene. So uh, what perhaps uh, we can hear next from Boris, would you be able to share your views uh, in, this, in this matter as well? Do you think that such government intervention is actually effective or actually disruptive in the, uh, for, for the supply demand balance? And whether there's actually any possibility for you know, the Chinese government to take subsequent rounds of uh, uh, actions or intervention, depending on where the, where the market goes, if it goes too high from here? Mm. So uh, on, on the on the second part of the question, I think market interventions usually it's it's very uh, uh, hard to implement because you know th there is the free market and then you know you try artificially to to manipulate things and so in the short term it might uh, work but in the long term you know it tends to deteriorate deteriorate the situation so th that's a, just a general remark about uh, any market intervention. Then on my view uh, on, on you know the, the, the metals commodity outlook, um, first I'm not a perma bull or a perma bear, uh, but when I look at the situation, I am extremely bullish on commodity prices, uh, and the reason is is that w when you look at you know the, the COVID crisis uh, first you know last year uh, you know prices crashed down, but it was much less than you know what you had in the in the great financial crisis so first to me that price action the fact that you know economic growth the decline in economic growth was much stronger than uh, you know uh, in in 2008 but the fact that commodity prices were more resilient to me is a signal that actually the 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 fundamental backdrop of the commodity market is different and is probably more bullish than it was a few years ago. That's the first thing. Then when you look at, you know, the, the commodity prices versus other risk assets, let's say, you know, you look at the US stock market, the, you know, there is just a ratio commodity divided by the US stock market. And what you, what you see is that commodity prices in general are extremely cheap right and so i think the covid uh, 19 crisis was such you know a big event that it has the power you know to change to create an inflection point you know uh, and so you know that's that what makes me think that you know it's the start of a bull market 
uh, and it has lasted only you know a little bit more than 12 months so it's nothing you know that's the third thing the third thing is like when you look at you know uh, the monetary or fiscal interventions now you know the world is getting addicted to uh, monetary and fiscal policy right so to me the the, the risk reward is is extremely skewed in favor of commodities because you know uh either uh you know the the the, the world is recovering the economic world is, is in a recovery and you have strong demand for commodity prices so copper prices go up and other commodity prices go up or you know you still have a lot of uncertainty around the delta variant which means that central bank you know they will continue to intervene and now they know you know the the you know fiscal authorities are now you know like stepping stepping up their game you know they are giving money to the people you know oh. in the us and it's going to be uh, everywhere else you know in in china they want to avoid you know social protests so you know the even the the digitalization you know of currency right it's going to be more and more uh, easy for governments you know to intervene and stimulate their economy it's artificial you know it, it's good for the short term not necessarily good for the long run but that you know uh, is a lot of money you know into the commodities right so uh, it's like in both cases commodity prices uh, will inflate you know whether it's the good way uh, and it's fundamentally driven or it's the bad way and it's speculatively speculatively driven you know so that's why uh, what we're seeing now you know uh, we've seen some decline you know from may with a rebound in the dollar uh, but to me that's you know i view that as some cyclical weakness meaning that you know indeed production growth industrial production growth peaked you know in q2 uh, uh, global industrial production growth peaked in q3 you know china it was uh, a quarter before uh, and so there is you know some uh, natural consolidation but when you look at the longer term picture uh, it's very bullish. Even you know, this, you know, when I say like the fundamental backdrop is different than a few years ago. When you look at the supply, you know, spending uh, capex, they they have they have declined. You know, uh, com mining companies they are really reluctant to spend. So it's not like in 2011 where they they were extremely bullish. You know, and this is uh, true for copper, but for you know most commodities. You know, even when you look at oil. You know, oil now is hated because everyone is speaking, you know, about this decarbonization. But, you know, the, the fundamental backdrop to me, it's the long term is, is bullish because commodity, you know, have the, 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 they tend to move all together. So, you know, some might perform better than others, but usually they move together. And I think, you know, like the, the commodity market in general uh, is, is due to do very well, you know, in the in the in the long term. And so, if I had to choose, you know, uh, when you look at investors, they are completely underweight uh, commodities and overweight, you know, financial assets such as equities or, you know, like in the financial industry. When you look at the S and P 500, energy companies they are underrepresented. You know, so I think you know it's an inflection point, and that's the the beginning more than the end. So I'm 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 very bullish. All right, thanks, Boris. Uh, that was very interesting to hear. I think I wanted to ask uh, this question because uh, uh, I mean it has been brought up earlier that the Delta variant for COVID-19 is definitely appearing in our news more and more every day, and uh, seems to be posing another round of threat globally, quite potentially. Uh, so perhaps I can ask Edric, uh, what scenario can we foresee? Like, will it be like a similar episode in March, or will it be a slightly milder version in your view? If 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 let's say the COVID Delta variant really ends up, we end up with a blown up scenario. Sure, I I am not a no WHO expert, but uh, <laughs> you know this is my own personal uh, opinion. Firstly, it's been around here for two years now. Yeah, it's evolving. Uh, it's it's uh, it's not going to go away just overnight. Uh, I, I foresee it's going to be here to stay for good, and we have to live with it. So, but one one thing is what we observe in the market. At least when I speak to some of the corporates, is some of their buying patterns, or at least their purchasing behaviors, have changed. 
So in the, in the past, you know, some believe in just in time uh, methodology, you know, by the Japanese and then, okay, I'll keep little stocks. I just buy when I, when I need. Uh, however, that has since have changed since last year. And in fact, people are, are, are also are holding a bit more stocks right now in case of all these, you know, short term surprises, uh, you know, squeezes, etc. So, but then again, this poses a risk to them as well. Because I'm holding more stocks, I'm eating out my working capital, and potentially what happens if there's a correction in prices, then I may be hurt in my balance sheet. So that is where our role here, at least, you know, uh, my, I'm an advocate for hedging I, 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 together with all our partners is that, you know, you'd have to hedge your, your price risk. If you're holding more stocks, uh, advisable that you, you also do, do come, uh, you know, to the market like the LME to hedge your metals price. The other thing is, oh, I think I mentioned earlier, is about you know potentially short-term squeezes. Yes, we do have a uh, you know fairly balanced market. Supply is out there, producers are coming back. Uh, but then again, you know now it's delta. Then next could be some some something else, and you may have short-term lockdowns. Uh, probably, I won't say like what we had last year, where you have a global shutdown. Uh, but probably probably pockets of areas, certain ports, certain jurisdiction, things like that. So. If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, then you may not have, you know, then we may see certain premiums of metals uh, spiking up because unable to reach the destination in time. So I won't be surprised to see short-term uh, squeezes uh, potentially uh, uh, in, in that sense. Again, as traders or even as consumers, then again, as an advocate, do hedge your price risk, you know, because we can't tell what the price of it will be tomorrow. So I think with greater uncertainty in the market, say be it COVID, there will be greater volatility. Greater volatility, then prices will gyrate a bit more. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for giving us a very comprehensive overview. I think we have a very good picture on a macro level right now. So perhaps to bring our discussion to a more focused level on the individual base metal markets. So for the entire base metal complex, I think for the large part of this one and a half year rally, it seems that copper and aluminium have been the price leaders for a large part of this one and a half year period. So Boris, uh, in terms of fundamentals, can you share with us uh, any insight to the copper and aluminium markets? And especially, I think there's uh, some supply issues that, we, that has been uh, concerning mm -hmm. Chile for copper and also on the aluminium side in China. Uh, how are these uh, problems affecting these respective markets? Yes, very good question. But I would say that you forgot tin. Tin is actually, uh, you know, the, the, the metal that is uh, performing the best this year. So, you know, even with the, 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 the hard uh, sell-off that we've seen uh, last week, you know, tin is still up 60% on the year. Uh, aluminium plus 26%. Uh, and copper, it's up now only 11%. Back in May, it was up plus 30%. So the, on, on, on the team, very quickly, well, what happens is that, you know, just it's uh, uh, the supply is extremely tight and demand uh, keeps growing because, you know, demand is from uh, the electronic sector, semiconductors, and, you know, there will be at some point a change in spending patterns, you know, from physical goods, electronics to, to services. But right now, you know, electronics demand is still resilient. And at the same time, supply is, is, is tight. Uh, you have extremely low level of inventories. Uh, and plus, what is uh, complicated is to move the metal from Asia to uh, the rest of the world, especially Europe and the US. And the US, there is no tin producer there, so it complicates everything, and you have premium, you know, shooting higher. So tin is the, is the, is the tightest. Copper, uh, you know, back then it, uh, in May it was the second best performer. Now it's you know it's in the middle of the pack, and you know we attribute the reason more to macroeconomic factors because copper is uh, you know the best play for you know macro investors, and so. Uh, to us, you know, it has, in, it has been impacted more negatively than the rest of the complex with these negative macro forces, such as the stronger dollar or the weakness, you know, in Chinese economic growth and, uh, and, and the rest. So that's, the, 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 that's why, you know, it's declining. But when you look at copper now, uh, you're seeing like healthy signs in the market because the, when you look at China, uh, you know, for, 
a few a few months ago we were worried you know about the deteriorating state in the chinese copper market with premium going on going down and sentiment bearish and the arb closed right now what you're seeing is that the import arbitrage has opened you see premiums going strongly higher and you see you know the mood is changing positively uh, and you 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 see that uh, people now they realize that supply is tight so that you want to see you know that's why it reinforces our view that the consolidation we have uh, you know since may is is transient and we we should see you know uh, 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 higher prices you know going into q4 aluminium is is in the very short term is slightly in a more bullish uh, backdrop because of the supply uh, and you see, you know, with the, ele ele um, the the power shortages, where you know, proven many provinces force smelters to reduce, uh, you know, electricity consumption. So it has an impact now uh, on production. And you see also uh, firm premiums, especially in Europe and the US. You see falling inventories. So you know, it creates a bullish backdrop, and that's why. Contrary to copper, uh, uh, aluminium prices are, are, have been more resilient. You know, they went down last week, but they they come back up much more fastly because the the uh, the, the fundamental picture is slightly better in the short run. Um, and so that's that's why we're we're still you know, more bullish on aluminium in the short term. Um, and and yeah, so that's on 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 the on the supply side. So it's uh, when you look also. Uh, at the NBS data, you know, because you, you're seeing like uh, announcement electricity, uh, you know, consumption reduction, and it's showing up in the data, you know, NBS official data, they show that aluminum production in China declined sequentially for uh, third months in a row. So, you know, it tells you that the dynamic here is changing. So it's, uh, it adds more uh, bullishness, you know, on, on aluminum. Um, and yeah, so that's, uh, uh, so, that's why you know, but tin remains the tightest probably um, uh, for for now. All right, thank you, Boris. Yeah, I think we are seeing uh, recently just quite a sharp drop in tin prices after a strong rally. So I think probably we can expect the volatility to continue at least for a while. Okay, uh, perhaps I'd like to cover a bit on spreads. As we know, spread trading is also quite common for base metals. And I'd like to ask uh, Jolene, can we hear from you how the cash to three month spreads of copper, aluminum, or any other markets, how are they generally behaving at the moment? And what are the opportunities that you see in the market for spread or carry traders? So I think, uh, you know, this seminar is really uh, a very good time because I think, uh, you know, the spreads has been very volatile. Uh, you know, in the last uh, one and two weeks. So, so for for short term uh, carry traders, I think it's a great opportunity now to monetize and basically trade short term spreads because you know the market is moving a lot. So, just to give you an idea, um, aluminium cash to three spreads is trading at 20, 22 back at the moment, and as early as you know last week, it was trading at a very small contango, maybe around three to five. So, the market spread has tightened a lot in basically the last week. So I think one of the main reasons uh, that's causing this tightness in the market is basically very strong buoyant physical premium, which I think Boris touched on um, earlier, that is basically creating opportunities for traders. So if you're a, a trader holding on to physical at the moment, any contango you receive is basically a bonus. And you can also afford to pick it up in backwardation because premiums are very strong. So one of the main reason uh, that is, you know, causing this uh, high premium is basically um, the Russian export taxes on Russell. So this is especially so in Europe. Uh, the, the, re the, the main reason is due to, you know, the shipping disruption that we're seeing and basically very high freight costs of, you know, basically transporting, uh, you know, bringing materials, transporting materials from all over the world into Europe. That's basically pushing this premium higher and also low regional inventories and very strong um, downstream demand that is supporting premiums in US and Europe. So this is keeping um, you know, the cash to threes um, exceptionally tight. Um, and also going forward, uh, an important variable for premium and therefore uh, spreads is whether this Russian Texas, uh, will it be extended or not past uh, December? And also how would Russell uh, respond as a result? Um, you know, will they be passing on 
um, 100 percent of this tariff cost onto the customers or will they be you know altering or renegotiating some of their long-term off-take agreements so i think uh this would basically impact uh you know where the cash to threes uh you know spreads will be trading on aluminium and moving on to copper um i think the spreads has gotten extremely exciting again um over the last one week so cash to three spread is trading at around 28 back at the moment and just last week, to give you an idea, it was uh, trading at around 20 contango and the week before 30 contango. So it's tightened a lot in um, the last one week. And I think one of the main reasons that you know is driving this tightness is that uh, the China import arbitrage window is basically open, uh, is basically re-emerged. So uh, we'll be expecting to see you know big volumes coming into the domestic China market um, from the LME you know in the next couple of months. Um, and on top of that, uh, the China import Yangshan premium has also surged actually to the highest level in 2017. So for those who are interested, uh, it's trading at around Reming B of uh, 122 per ton. Uh, this is basically, uh, like Boris mentioned before, is uh, driven by you know improved demand sentiments in terms of uh, imported copper into China. And also, um, you know, the sell-off that we saw last Thursday in terms of LME prices is supportive of this up. And um, on top of that, there's also tightness uh, in the domestic market uh, in terms of uh, power rationing in China, and also um, concern over, you know, the Delta variant spread, which might disrupt, uh, potentially disrupt any domestic production uh, in China. So I think ultimately, uh, you know, China import demand will be the main source of uh, copper spread volatility in the short term. So for traders who are also uh, looking to trade something else other than the up, uh, they can actually look into trading uh, flow related imbalances in spread, for example, around monthly positioning as well as um, index rolling. Right, Jolene, thank you very much. I think I also want to highlight, um, I think lead cash to three month spreads also expect up to a very high level so what what can we expect to see in the short term uh, would it be a short correction or uh, would it stay at current high levels for the lead cash with one spread so i think you know it's, it's quite interesting right now for you know the metals across uh, all six base metal i think five metals are all trading in backwardation so there's clearly you know a supply squeeze that we're seeing in the market right now and I think lead has been, you know, making headlines, I think, today and yesterday, uh, mainly because, um, you know, the spread is trading um, at around 200 back uh, cash to threes, as high as 200 back. Maybe today has gone down to around 170 back. So um, everyone is expecting, uh, you know, some similar squeeze to what we see in tin uh, in, in April, where it went all the way back to 6,500. So I think for lead, it's quite interesting because, um, you know, it's basically a dislocation in terms of um, physical premium based on the region uh, where you can get access to um, to lead. So right now, there's a supply glut that is happening in onshore China. However, um, due to you know the shipping disruption as well as um, you know very high you know shipping charges, um, there's actually a shortage of um, demand, especially in US and Europe. And this is causing, you know, the very large backwardation that we're seeing on cash to threes at the moment. So it is very volatile, and um, you know, it's highly dependent on, you know, how, uh, you know, how fast, you know, the shipping uh, crisis is going to resolve. So I think the tightness is here to stay. Um, I think, you know, COVID is like Edric mentioned, right? <laughs> it's going to be, you know, here for quite some time. So um, I think the, I think a lot of analysts are expecting. You know the shipping crisis to you know extend to as early as you know uh, 2022. So probably sometime you know in the next um, half of next year. Right. Thanks, Jolene. Okay. Uh, I think we've covered quite a bit on the price uh, activity. Uh, uh, next, the next topic will be on sustainability. Um, I think sustainability has been a, quite a big topic, especially for commodities and even for other asset classes under the broader ESG theme. So to put this in a base metals context, I think one area of focus is would be on electric vehicles, because uh, many of the metals uh, used in the construction of uh, electric vehicles can be, especially on the rechargeable batteries, they can be found and traded or hatched on LME. 
So Boris, I want to ask you for your opinion. How do you think uh, this uh, trend, I think right now it's still quite early stage, but how do you foresee this trend as we transition from traditional cars to electric vehicles? How would it impact uh, these battery metals in, and uh, what are the price and demand trends that we can expect to see for the medium to long term? So, so I would say the, the, the key concept to understand here is, uh, you know, the, the S-curve. So it's the, you know, the adoption of new technologies, because when you look at, uh, you know, forecast in, in the industry, they tend to be like cautious, conservative and linear. They, you know, basically the consensus is, uh, OK, uh, you know, EV sales, they are growing. You have, you know, governments, uh, you know, subsidizing, etc. So it's going to increase the adoption, uh, but in a, in, a, in a linear fashion. But uh, if you think about it, EVs, you know, are, are new technologies, you know, and so you could draw a parallel, uh, you know, with the internet or, you know, the mobile phone. And those technology, they tend to adopt like, you know, a S curve, they follow S curve, meaning that at the beginning, you know, it's very uh, little adoption, you know, only the, the geeks, and also because the cost is very high, so you know people are not interested, and they say like, why, why do I need this new technologies? What I have works? And then when you know the cost starts to decline, uh, and the access becomes more global, you see uh, an explosive growth. You know, and I think you know when you look at uh, where we are now, uh, global EV sales they represent around three percent of global sales, right? So it's it's very low for now. Uh, and so, you know, it, in, it, in, uh, it makes a thing that, you know, we're at the beginning of this S-curve and that, you know, we're going to see explosive growth in, in the coming decades. Uh, and, you know, and, and that's probably why uh, Elon Musk, you know, uh, last year say, please mine more nickel, you know, uh, this comment is because you understand the dynamics, you know, the how, uh, you know, like uh, new technology get, can get adopted very fast. Uh, and so it's going to be a very positive for uh, green, um, green metals, you know, and we're thinking about copper, we're thinking about lithium um, and, and nickel, obviously, you know. So uh, th this also, you know, it's another long term positive factor that change you know, meaningfully the, 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 the fundamental backdrop of some metals, you know, uh, and, and right now the mining industry is not really ready for it, you know, they try to adapt, but, you know, they are much slower than they should be, uh, especially, you know, if this S-curve is, uh, is respected. Right, thanks, Boris. I think uh, we have a lot to expect from uh, this up and coming trend. So uh, next question, I'd like to ask Edric, talking about these uh, battery metals, I understand that LME has also listed a few contracts for a few of these uh, metals used in battery production. Would you be able to share with us more on uh, these uh, contract details of these uh, metals that are, that are being discussed? Sure, sure. Uh, indeed, we just launched a new few uh, contracts on LME for, to tackle uh, around electric vehicles. I think to begin with, we already have a very liquid market for nickel, copper, and aluminium. So these are a lot of metals that is being uh, predominantly used or in higher demand to produce electric vehicles, uh, like uh, Boris did mention just now. So the other two uh, contracts, I would say uh, we're focusing now on cobalt and lithium. On cobalt, on the LME, we have two. One is a physical deliverable contract, and then the other one is a cash settled uh, contract that actually priced off uh, Boris's company, Fast Markets. So we use the uh, fast market's uh, daily prices and then come up with a monthly average future contract for participants to, to hatch. So, it's a, so in fact, this allows participants to have a choice whether they want to catch a physical product or just a cash settled uh, contract based on fast markets. Uh, last but not least, of course, just last month, we launched the lithium hydroxide uh, contract. Once again, uh, thanks to fast markets, we are using fast markets uh, uh, weekly price on this. Uh, so it's going to be a simple uh, monthly average, again, monthly average cash settled uh, contract, uh, settles against fast markets price. And also, if you want to find out more about this contract and also to see the lithium hydroxide prices that is published on a weekly basis, you can access it for free because we work together with fast markets to allow the weekly publishers uh, of, of this price on LME website. Thank you. Thanks, Cedric. So apart from uh, 
electric vehicles, I think from a broader sustainability perspective, uh, based on this rising trend and focus on sustainability by, I believe it's the entire world, from the exchange perspective, how do you think that this upcoming trend will be adopted by the market and impact the base metals industry in the mid to long term? Yeah, I think indeed sustainability, I think it will be the new buzzword. And in fact, I think if you want to talk about full sustainability, we will be a full webinar by itself, I think. Okay, just very briefly, I think on the LME side, we have started the, the track on, on, on sustainability. First and foremost, uh, I think now people are concerned about how their metals are mined, where the metals are mined, etc. So we, we first started off with the responsible sourcing implementation uh, back in 2019. Uh, and then progressively now, uh, it is still ongoing. What this is, is really uh, centering around human rights, okay, against uh, child abuse, child labor, things like that. But I think uh, markets participants want something more than just, just you know, uh, human, human rights control. So we are looking at sustainability on a much, much broader space now. So um, end of this month, in fact, in uh, 30th, 31st August, we're going to launch a system called LME Passport. So this passport is actually a digital register to digitize all the certificate of analysis. That's the first step. The second step is because it's already working as a you know, very robust, like a, a, a digital register, will allow producers on a voluntary basis to actually include other provenance documents onto LMA passport. So things like you know, perhaps industry certification for aluminum, perhaps it could be IAI, uh, copper could be copper mark, things like that. And also allowing producers to also share things like, you know, what's their carbon emission? What's their greenhouse gas emission levels? So such information will be, uh, you know, on a voluntary basis, producers able to use this platform to, to, to showcase the, the brands, the metal brands uh, 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 available to, to the market. So what we'll do is we will collate the information that is uh, published on uh, LME Passport, and this will be made available uh, to all users uh, at a brand level on the LME website for free. So of course, this is going to be you know, a first day of implementation, but we expect gradually over time, more and more producers to actually come in and you know, jump on the bandwagon to, to, um, uh, to start you know, uh, 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 disclosing such relevant information. And last but not least, the, you know, we just now we talk about uh, the contract on cobalt and lithium. So that, those are some of the new contracts that, that, that we have launched. In addition to that, we want to promote circular economy recycling, reuse. So that's it. You know, I know it's not, not, not to do so much with base metals, but we also launched new contracts like scrap, steel scrap in Taiwan, India, and we have already a Turkey steel scrap. And we do have a aluminum used beverage can contract in the United States. So this is another way that uh, we want to encourage, you know, the circular economy and, and sustainability uh, uh, drive in the long term. Wow, that's very interesting to hear. Okay, thanks, uh, Edric. Okay, so moving to our last segment, I think we'll touch a bit on the cross-market arbitrage opportunities. Uh, as of current, we see that base metal contracts are currently being listed, not just on LME, but also in COMEX under CME Group, and also in the Chinese exchanges, Chai, Shanghai Futures Exchanges, as well as the International Energy Exchange. So perhaps I would like to ask Jolene, what, how can uh, market participants capture these kind of cross-market arbitrage opportunities across these uh, various exchanges and whether there are any, uh, any opportunities that they can exploit at this moment? Yeah, I think as yeah, mentioned before, you know, there is, uh, you know, opportunities, uh, the app window is definitely open right now for um, copper as well as aluminium with regards to LME and Shifi. So I think, uh, you know, I think for me, I would probably go through um, probably the two types of app opportunity. And for, I think the viewers who, dialing, who are dialing in this evening, I think probably the first app opportunity would be uh, the paper app, which is more relevant to you. Uh, this is basically by taking opposing a position, opposing positions on two exchange, and basically hopefully profiting from any price convergence or divergence. And the second type of app opportunity is basically trading the physical app. So this is quite common for um, our merchant clients as well as our trade clients. So when the app open, when the app window is open, the traders would basically um, long LME futures and short Shifi futures to basically log in the app difference. 
And on top of that, the trader would purchase a physical, whether it's copper or aluminium, on the spot market outside of China and eventually shipping it into China. And depending on the market condition, then they can either deliver physical against the Shifi future position or they can sell the metal locally basis Shifi price to close off the Shifi future position. So, um, you know, for AMT, we do provide trading platforms that can help you simultaneously execute both the LME and the Shifi up position. So the most common up, like I mentioned before, is the LME and Shifi up. So the reason is because, you know, participants can basically trade up across all six base metal on the line and followed by the LME and uh, COMEX copper up, where we do see some decent liquidity, as well as um, up opportunity, opportunity, especially in the last uh, couple of months. So the, this is also a product that um, AMT offers. And like you mentioned, with the introduction of the new iron E copper um, last year, um, I think that's, uh, you know, get it quite a lot of uh, market interest. Uh, the reason is because it gives international participants access into an alternative um, Chinese copper market. So this itself presents further opportunity for any cross exchange up. So, if, you know, as an offshore trader, previously, if you want to trade um, Shifi copper, you would basically need a Wufi, which requires, you know, quite high capital costs and also additional government uh, regulatory approval, which might take some time. However, you know, with the launch of this new INE copper contract, uh, it's available to both domestic as well as overseas investors. Uh, the prices are net off tariffs as well as VAT. Uh, they are also stored in a bonded storage facility. And even though these contracts, you know, they're priced in CNY, uh, you can use foreign currency as a pledge for margin. So um, as an overseas investor, uh, you know, you can participate basically uh, in this INE copper through opening an account with any domestic FCM uh, onshore China. Uh, the other way is basically opening an account with um, an overseas intermediary like ourselves, uh, AMT. So through AMT, you know, clients, uh, you know, will be able to trade um, both LME and INE from a single account, which basically help optimizes capital. So uh, one way to basically access um, the exchange is through trading members um, of these exchanges. So at AMT, we are a Cat1 member of the LME. We work very closely with uh, Edric. So we are also one of the most uh, longest active participants uh, of the LME with a history of over 100 years. Uh, so we also do provide trading access to um, COMEX as well as the INE. So I think, uh, you know, with the introduction of these new um, products, as well as, you know, increased international participation, I think it's a great opportunity now, you know, to be in touch. Uh, so you will be able to capitalize on any cross market up opportunities, you know, when they arise. Right. Thanks, Jolene. <clears throat> Uh, over to Edric, I think uh, predominantly the cash and the three month forwards have been the main contracts that are being traded on LME, right? But also quite a while back, LME has also been uh, pushing the monthly futures. Can you share with us more about this contract, the monthly futures and how market participants can use them for the hedging and the trading strategies? Sure, sure. Ning Hao. Yes. Uh, predominantly, yes, you're right. Three months is the most active uh, contract and it still is electronically on, uh, on, on, on our platform. But uh, we, we heard the, the request from the market that for participants who want to trade regular monthly futures. So regular monthly futures contracts are uh, uh, you know, now available on our, on, on our platform as well. Because what we have did in, in over the past one or two years is we have actually turned on implied pricing. So what in gist, in simple terms, is we took the price, the best bid and offer price from the three months price, and the spreads that's been quoted, say three months to a, a, a monthly future for, for that matter, and automatically compute the monthly future prices uh, for the participants. So now if you turn on LME Select, you can, besides the three months, you can see, say, copper aluminum, you can see the September, October, November, December price. So for participants who want to trade regular monthly futures, you can do so. And, you know, just not mentioned, if you want to trade arbitrage and you find that it's a, a hassle to trade three months and a monthly with, say, other exchanges, now you can do so much simpler electronically. And I'm pleased that, you know, like EMT, they have, you know, platform where you easily be able to trade both uh, effectively uh, an up or a spread 
uh, uh, easily via such a multi futures. So I think this really opened up the doors uh, for the traditional physical guys who wants to trade uh, three months and you know to match the specific shipping delivery date. You can continue to do so. We will keep that. But for those that want to trade monthly futures, you can do so on the LME now as well. Right. Thanks, Edric. Thanks for the information. Right. I'm mindful of our time. Uh, next, uh, we will move on to the Q&A session. We've got a few questions, but if you have any question, do feel free to send them in. Okay, uh, we have this question that's actually addressed to Boris. Um, how do you actually see the backwardation for TIN in the coming days, in the short term? Will it be, uh, do you expect to see a reversal? Yes, so uh, it was interesting that on Friday, uh, the cash remote spread uh, closed in Contango, you know, for the first time, uh, I think since like December of last year. So it was clearly a change. Um, and I think this is an indication that the short squeeze is over. And so, you know, there are two negative factors for, for you know, like the front end of the curve is that first you have the, the refined market tightness that is easing, you know, with supply growth continuing to, to accelerate and uh, demand growth to, to decelerate. And plus, you have the negative macro factors that pushed in prices uh, lower, and so that the the, the traders uh, holding long position, uh, it will be harder for them, you know, to squeeze the market. It's the conditions now are less favorable. So, but at the same time, you know, the the tin market is still tight, so we still expect a backwardation. But probably we think that the 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 peak has already been reached, you know, so it's going to stay in a backward, backward dated uh, structure, but uh, not, you know, as excessive as it was a, a few months ago. But maybe Jolene has a different view because she's the expert on the, on the spreads. <laughs> yeah, I All think right. the tin, uh, yeah, I think, you know, the, the tin to, to add on to, to Boris, I think yeah, the tin spread has definitely eased uh, a lot, you know, in the last couple of months. Um, I think to add on, I think I would say that, you know, the inventory, you know, is still at a low level right now. And, you know, any fresh supply disruption that we see, uh, you know, might basically trigger, you know, another upwards uh, movement in prices. Yeah. And right. might cause the spread to be tighter. Yeah. Okay. Thank you both. Okay. I think we can squeeze in one last question. Uh, and this is uh, got to do with the Jackson Hole meeting that we can be expecting later this week. But in general, we have this question. In general, USD has been appreciating based on expectations of uh, tapering. Would this be a headwind for commodities play? Um, perhaps I can put this question to Boris or Jolene or Edric. Uh, yes, so, uh, you, you know, the, the Jackson Hole meeting, the, the, the fact first that it's virtual, you know, tells you a, a little bit about how, you know, like uh, Fed policymakers are dealing with the Delta variant and they are very cautious. So there was some fears, you know, of tapering uh, because, you know, the, the, the latest Fed minute said that there would be some tapering by year end. But, you know, now with the, the situation that is deteriorating, uh, it's more complicated for, uh, you know, Fed Chair Powell to come up, you know, with the same bold statement. So I think he will choose uh, caution, you know, and patience. So, you know, that might ease uh, a little bit financial conditions. Plus, you know, they they know about the taper tantrum mistake that they did, you know, uh, back in 2013. So they will be very cautious, you know, about their, their, their rhetoric and how they use it. Um, and so, the, the 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 dollar index, uh, you know, in our view, the, the the macro fears that we're seeing, you know, because we look at different factors, and what we think is that we have macro fears now, and they will probably ease at some point in Q4. Uh, but you know, now there will be some volatility uh, probably because of the, you know, it's not only about what Fed Chair Powell says; it's about how the market interprets it. So, you know, it's like uh, second orders and it's, uh, it's tough, you know. Right. Thanks, Boris. So I think uh, we can probably uh, 
it would be better if we stay tuned to the meeting and expect some market action <laughs> end of this week. Okay, I'd like to turn our session to, for, for today here. And uh, thank you very much, Edric, Jolene, and Boris for the very good thank discussion you. today. And also thank, thank you, you to all of our audience who are here with us today. Do remember that if you have any questions about base metals trading, do feel free to reach out to us at Philly Futures. I'll now pass the mic back to Sri. Well, thank you so much uh, for being a wonderful audience and thank you for the questions as well. Uh, the conversation does not have to end here. If you have more questions for our speakers, just uh, type them down in our survey form right after this webinar. And once again, I would like to thank our panelists, Edric, Boris and Jolene. Thank you for being here today. We totally enjoyed the insights that you shared earlier. And Minhao, thank you for the moderating of the webinar. And dear audience, once again, this webinar could not be could not have been possible without you. So thank you for joining us for this session and send your questions, if any, in the survey form. All right, thank you. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, very much. you, thank you Michal. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe.